Do you like satisfying instances of reincorporation? Do you like people getting murdered to the tune of upbeat music? Have you ever watched X-Men and was like, yeah, that was great, but what if there was more crying and daddy issues? And by daddy issues, I mean an exploration of parental neglect and how it affects your ability to form meaningful relationships, communicate clearly with others, and regulate your own emotions as an adult. If any of that sounded interesting, then you should watch The Umbrella Academy, because you'll probably like it a whole lot, just like me. If this is the first you've heard of the show, basically, on the 1st of October 1989, 43 babies were born to women who weren't pregnant at the beginning of the day. A rich douche by the name of Sir Reginald Hargreaves wants to collect them all and study them and then use them to fight crime since most of them have magic powers. He managed to get seven of them and raised them horribly. First tip-off should have been that he gave them numbers instead of names. They do have normal names now, those names were given to them by their robot mommy Hargreaves built for them. The show begins when Hargreaves dies and all of his children return to their childhood home for the funeral. They're not really straight up mourning though, and some of them only seem to be there to just insult what cremains of him. The show was actually based off of a comic book written by Jared Way. He wanted to make comic books before My Chemical Romance blew up. I really like all the characters in the show, both the mains and the sides. I think the actors and actresses nail this balance between coming off like they all grew up together and know each other, but the awkwardness of having spent most of their adult lives avoiding each other always comes leaking through. Going in order of their number, you got Super Strong Luther. He's the one who was loyal to his crap dad until the day he died, and then the next day, and the next day, and basically the more time you spend with him, the more accurate these memes become. You got Mr. God damn my family. Hey, wait, what the f did you just f***ing say about my family? He also goes by Diego. He can throw knives with inhumanly good accuracy, and he's not gonna hold his breath indefinitely waiting for his dad to change. He's a strong, independent vigilante, and he doesn't need no daddy. Allison is the world's most warranted case of imposter syndrome. She has the ability to brainwash people with her words. This takes the format, I heard a rumor blank. As in, I heard a rumor, I nailed this audition. Or more frighteningly, I heard a rumor, you love me. Allison's marriage has recently gotten nuked out of existence. Then we have Klaus. As we all know, the problem with dead people is that they just don't have any Wi-Fi. Klaus fixes that. Unfortunately, dead people don't have a good connection right now because Klaus's powers don't work when he's high, and that's... that's all the time. My favorite character, number five, a teenage boy playing an old man playing a teenage boy. He can move through space well and time poorly. His dad warned him not to time travel, but he did it anyway. He ended up getting trapped many years in the future where something mysterious that has to do with the plot had destroyed humanity. When the story begins, he manages to time travel back to his family. He's young again because of time shenanigans and he wants to stop the apocalypse, but nobody's taking him very seriously. Then we got Ben. He's a mystery, so I don't, I'm not going to talk about him. I'm going to talk about him in the full analysis. Finally, lucky number seven. Unlucky Vanya. Her thing is that she's normal. She doesn't have powers, so she was excluded from the Umbrella Academy. Her father quite literally told her there was nothing special about her. At the beginning of the story, Vanya holds herself with this kind of exhausted dignity. I think this was a really good use of Ellen Page. Since Ellen is 5'1", the camera regularly uses her size to make her look even more dominated by her siblings. At first, she can come off as kind of a blank audience surrogate, but she busts out of that and she has some really great big acting moments at the end of the season. Getting on to the sides, Hazel and Chacha are also very endearing as underpaid, underappreciated assassins who kind of function as a buddy cop duo, only they're evil and trying to make sure the world ends. And then there is Pogo, he's a chimpanzee Reginald experimented on and gave of human intelligence. He looks really good, and he has a very soothing, consoling presence. I really like the way this show drip feeds information. It makes rewatching the show more fun because you realize all the small details you missed the first time around. Scenes get recontextualized when you know all of the things that X character knows, and then you can properly appreciate little nuances to the performance or background elements. If you keep an ear out, you'll even notice small sound effects giving away major plot spoilers that you might have totally missed the first time around because they just didn't mean anything to you yet. The way the characters bounce off of each other just feels really organic and cute, especially the sibling stuff. Although everyone's always running around, they try to make sure almost everyone gets their time in with everyone else. But I still wish there were more group discussions, those were kind of my favorite. So who might not like this show? If you lose your marbles when there are a lot of mysteries that need solving and explaining, but nobody's in a big rush to solve or explain it, characters don't feel like explaining some of the bigger mysteries of the show just because they already know what the answers are. Or they just don't care. 
Most of the characters are passive for the first half of the story and are not trying to further the plot. They're doing things that will affect the plot, just not on purpose. Most of the siblings blow off Five when he tells them that the world is ending. If you're the type of person that can't carry on when you realize a show has one or two or a few Ooh. plot holes, we'll go over all that later in detail since as a YouTuber, 30% of my caloric intake has to come from obsessing over small details or I lose all sensation in my extremities. If anything I said is sending you good vibrations, I think you should just go for it. I genuinely loved it. It's derivative of a lot of things, but I think it harmonizes all of its little pieces into something that feels very unique. Okay, so I'm gonna do the big ol' analysis where I slobber all over the show. And I'm gonna spill all the spoiler beans, so skedaddle unless you're into that sort of thing. There's always choice. A big part of Umbrella Academy is examining the effect Reginald Hardgreave's abuse and emotional neglect had on his children. These emotional traumas metastasize differently in each of them. Luther has the most different reaction when contrasting him to his siblings. Reginald expected Luther to be the leader of the Umbrella Academy, but instead Luther became the world's most obedient follower in his quest to be recognized by his father. The way he defends his father makes his siblings uncomfortable and frustrated. He doesn't even want to admit that he relates to their strength struggles so he can barely lead them. Something interesting to note is that occasionally it does seem like Luther got closer to his father than the rest of them managed to. In the courtyard at sundown. I say a few words. Just at dad's favorite spot. Dad had a favorite spot? Yeah, you know, under the oak tree. We used to sit out there all the time. None of you ever do that? But at what cost? Well, his body. Once Luther was the only remaining member of the Umbrella Academy, he was still sent on dangerous missions alone. You don't need to call me by my number anymore. Why not? Because I'm the only one left. After being critically injured, his father managed to save him by injecting him with a serum that made him kind of a man-ape hybrid. There's an interesting parallel between him and Pogo. It actually makes me quite uncomfortable. They're both die-hard loyal to Reginald. Pogo is loyal because he couldn't have the life he has if Reginald hadn't experimented on him. The road Luther went down turned him into Hargreaves experiment twice over, making a monkey out of him as the expression goes. Well, monkeys and apes aren't the same thing, but you know what I mean. Luther cannot even admit at first that he's unhappy about what's happened to him and refers to it only as his father saving his life. Something I found interesting is Luther describes the moon as lonely, cold, and quiet. But he notes that every once in a while, the sun would come rolling over the horizon, and if the light hit just right, everything would look like white glass. I see this as kind of a metaphor for Luther's life in general. His world is cold and in solitude, and just occasionally it's wonderful and his world glows and it all makes sense and that little taste of something good is enough to keep him going an absurdly long amount of time. It's what makes him think he's meant to be on the moon doing research at his father's request. It's what makes him think that his childhood was okay. I'm picturing his dad thanking him in a stern way, or him learning something about his father that the other kids don't know. Little things like that that would make him feel special, even though they're not even close to the amount of praise that he really deserves for his loyalty and hard work. You can contrast the cool glow of the moon with the warm golden glow of the scene where Luther finally gets to have his dance with Allison. They finally get to have the dance they wanted to have as kids, and the song that they dance to is Dancing in the Moonlight, if that wasn't on the nose enough. Luther's arc doesn't seem totally done, but I think this is a good foundation for a story about building self-love and self-confidence. I think Luther embodies the emotions of people who have or have had misplaced loyalty in an abusive parent. I'd like to share this quote. Because it is about them, no matter how hard we try to ingratiate ourselves to our parents, their feelings towards us won't change. When we fail to win their approval, we might feel hurt or even angry. But many of us also believe that we haven't tried hard enough to please them. The truth is love is not a commodity to be bought and sold. Our parents will love us if they are able to, and for no other reason. Still, it's easier to keep blaming ourselves because it is preferable to facing the unthinkable, the fact that our parents don't love us. This is an extreme extremely painful realization to come to terms with. Most people would rather do anything than accept this as the truth. Not only is it painful, it's humiliating. He used to answer to me for what he did. For sending me up there, I sacrificed everything for him my entire life. I never left this house. I never had friends. And for what? 
for nothing. On a different note, there are some details to the execution of Luther's story that are kinda licking my birthday cake. Mainly, the reveal of Luther's body. I think this subplot is not capitalized on well because the information is given to us in the wrong order, and the pivotal reveal scene makes some big mistakes that do damage to his story. When you see Luther, you'll quickly get the impression that he's trying to hide his body because of the turtleneck, gloves, and big overcoat that he wears all the time. If you look closely, you'll even notice some discoloration on his fingers. But here is what's visually obvious about Luther. He's a big boy. He's a quarterback wearing a waist trainer wearing another quarterback as a coat. But nobody's reacting to Luther as if he looks weird, so I think most people will assume that Luther is just big because of his powers. Sure, he looked normal as a kid, but maybe he continued to grow after adulthood. Maybe because of his powers, he has the capacity to get way more shredded than a normal human. Overall, you wouldn't think that there's a real mystery or that anything's amiss. In episode 1, Diego and Klaus are the two siblings whose initial reaction we get to see. And I don't think either conveys how actually confusing Luther's body would be if you grew up with him. These few seconds where Diego turns his head and seems to be analyzing Luther makes his reaction a bit closer to what you would expect. But this gets undermined later by Klaus's reaction. Klaus just seems impressed by how swole he is. This needs just a teaspoon more nervousness and then it would be fine. We needed to be alerted that Luther has a problem that has nothing to do with his powers. And we probably need to know that his siblings don't know about it. I think that would make seeing their reaction more entertaining. So the first clue we get that something weird is going on with Luther is when he gets injured and he covers his arm quickly and runs away. Then we see him alone in his room and what you're supposed to see here is that his arm is oddly hairy. So I've watched this scene on three different monitors and I would have done more but I don't want to knock on my neighbor's door and ask them to watch Netflix with me because I'm shy. But I've come to the conclusion that the darkness is not helping the scene. I should not be more uncomfortable with Luther's body when watching a scene of him standing in a hallway talking to Klaus than the first scene it's revealed. But I am because mostly what I'm getting here is that he's big and fluffy. In this scene, I can see all of the unpleasant details, the discoloration of his skin and the distortion of his muscles. This might sound super silly, but the main thing that makes me mad about this scene is this dinosaur footstep noise that plays as he walks away. What? These noises aren't normally used when Luther is walking around. This gives the impression that Luther is suddenly bigger. The first time watching this scene, I thought the reveal was that Luther gets bigger every time he bleeds, maybe in proportion to how much he's bleeding. But then I was like, well, he doesn't look bigger, and that's because he's not. That sound effect shouldn't be there. I think they wanted to use that sound to give you a sense of his size and weight. But like, buddy, I know he's big. He's been big the whole time. And then your brain explodes because you realize Allison and Diego didn't know this and they're surprised. And then the next episode they explain it, but it's just like, that's a hell of a mystery no one thought was a mystery. Huge fan of the furries. That's not what that word means. Or are you so high you think his whole body's a fursuit? He leaves behind a complicated legacy. He was a monster. <laughs> he was a bad person and a worse father. The world's better off without him. Diego. My name is number two. Diego's show powers are a little hard to nail down. He seems to have inhumanly accurate skills with throwing knives. I'm not exactly sure if that extends to his reflexes in general, though. Despite the fact that Diego hates Reginald for all of his abuse and emotional neglect, Diego is the one who essentially functions the way Reginald dreamed all of his children would. He is a vigilante who fights crime and protects people. And that's basically his whole life as he lives in the back room of a gym and pays rent there by doing custodial work. He's a rebel who has no real way to express his rebellion because he actually does seem to enjoy fighting and saving people. And it's kind of implied that Diego thinks these things make him special. Detective Patch, his ex-girlfriend, thinks that Diego needs to be a vigilante to feel like what he and his siblings went through in the Umbrella Academy mattered. So as bitter as it is that he's doing what his dad wanted him to do, it does validate his suffering because it was all of that training that led him to having these special skills. Therefore, Diego's only real way to express his disdain is to do kind of petty things like steal his father's monocle and break it, be a moody dingus to the people in his life, or fight Luther, 
who is the ultimate representation of being subservient to Reginald. I find it interesting that Diego seems to be the person the most actively peeved off about his sister Vanya writing a tell-all book about their family. All of them were hurt or embarrassed by Vanya writing the autobiography, but it's Diego who keeps antagonizing her. Huh. What is she doing here? You don't belong here, not after what you did. You're seriously gonna do this today? You may expect Diego to read Vanya's book and feel solidarity with her, but instead he doesn't want her to publicly spill the family's story. He wants to keep it contained and under wraps. This is a big departure from the comic where Diego secretly loves her. Here they don't get along, but are united by the sheer amount of emotions they feel about Reginald. However, at the beginning of the story, Diego's emotions about it run hot, where Vanya's run cold. And I get the sense that Diego might think that Vanya has no right to complain because she didn't have to fight like the rest of her siblings. Vanya's perspective on this is that she felt excluded, and so she felt ignored and worthless as a person. You got enough material for your sequel yet? He was my father too. A totally underrated thing I love about this show is their mother, Grace. She's a robot Reginald Hardgreaves built, and she feels like a breath of fresh air because most of the time when I see a plot like this, it comes down firmly on the side that AIs are human in any meaningful sense of the term. Umbrella Academy plays this a little differently, and so it gives me delicious, sad emotions. Grace is, in so many ways, so much more of a parent than Reginald ever was, but she's programmed to be that way. Sometimes she responds to questions like my Google Home, and so she comes off as very inhuman. But she has these little moments that are so sweet where she seems so real that it just breaks my heart. Diego is the most attached to her, and he has these moments where he grows frustrated with her and doubts her humanity. He made the world a better place. Stop it. Do you hear me? Stop trying to defend him. Mom, you gotta feel something. But he treated you worse than anyone. You worked for him for 30 years. He didn't even give you a room to sleep in. Contrast this with his frustration with Luther. He has very real love and emotions for this machine that might not be sentient and is just programmed to say what he wants to hear. After a fight where Cha-Cha and Hazel attack the house, Diego goes looking for Grace. When he finds her, he realizes that she has not noticed all of the fighting and is sewing a needle into her skin. This is what makes Diego decide to put his robot mama down. Pogo later repairs Grace, and when Diego sees her again, he finds that she's changed. I wonder what the weather is like today. It would be nice to go to the park. I never let you off the grounds. Your father isn't here anymore. You can do whatever you want. She doesn't come off as fully sentient now, but she has an interest in going for walks in the park. And she doesn't have to keep secrets if she doesn't want to. She's evolved beyond what Reginald intended her to be, and now her world has expanded. Diego values independence and freedom, so he seems satisfied that Grace is at least no longer Reginald's slave. I wish Diego's relationship with Detective Patch was different. It stands out to me as the weakest subplot of the season. The reason is because there's a huge disconnect between Living Detective Patch and Post-Mortem Detective Patch. Patch and Diego's story is that there's two people, they used to date, they're kinda similar, but they have a huge ideological divide because one person is a stern cop and the other is a rule-breaking vigilante. They're at a crossroads, their relationship can't function like this, something has to change. Suddenly, Patch bends a little. She calls Diego for backup. But when Diego arrives on the scene, he finds Patch dead. The window just slams closed. They couldn't establish proper emotional intimacy, and now they're out of time. The post-mortem Patch story is that there's a vigilante who wants to kill the killers of the woman he loves, but he's torn because he realizes that she was someone who believed people could change. When given the opportunity to avenge her, he spares the killer. He realizes that Patch believed in people, that she saw the good in everyone, and that she would not want this. Girlfriend Patch. What do you like about her? 
She believed in people. She always saw the good inside. I'm sure she'll be proud to know that you're killing Hazel and Chacha as a way to honor her memory. The problem is Patch never expresses these opinions, not about Diego, and much less about anyone else. Poor Patch, for the sake of Diego's development, they ignore the actual personality they gave her. There were opportunities to give Patch some dialogue to show this merciful side of her, but they were never taken. It makes me wonder if there was some pivotal scene that they cut out and someone who worked on the show is watching the season back like, Shit guys, we cut out the scene where she expresses value system. If that's not what happened, the writers didn't take the opportunity in the scenes they did have to do this. For example, the moment where Diego says Patch lives to put scum away. Patch could show offense at her suspects being referred to as scum. But her monologue takes a different direction. She lectures Diego about how this behind-the-scenes paperwork stuff is how actual convictions actually happen. And honestly, they'd have to rewrite most of her dialogue to fix this because Patch's actual value system is irrelevant in this situation. Patch just wants Diego to stop fiddling with her crime scenes so she can use all the existing evidence for her case and put the culprits behind bars. But Cha-Cha is a time-traveling assassin who will never see jail time because the world is gonna end in a few days. Okay, so script Dr. Glass is on. So let's obey the amount of time they give this situation. You need Patch dead by the end of episode 4, and you get 4 scenes with Patch and Diego while Patch is alive. But you need her death to be important to Diego's character development. First thing, they should have been an already established couple during the show even if they have an unstable, flaky relationship. I think too much of their dialogue is kind of wasted on this back and forth of Diego being like, you're attracted to me, and Patch rolling her eyes being like, <laughs> I'm not attracted to you, the absurdity. Coming from the guy dressed in spandex? It's not spandex, it's leather. He used to like it a lot, if I recall. God, please unremember that. Hey. They don't need to be broken up to have this exact same cop vigilante dynamic. Diego's fingerprints are still gonna end up all over that crime scene, so him getting in trouble is not gonna change. Another thing that's gotta go is Patch has to like Diego. This is super awkward, but I don't think Patch loves him. I can barely find evidence she like likes him. In their first scene together, she tases Diego. Shit. Hang on. Let me just... When Diego makes dirty jokes to flirt with her, she doesn't laugh. She doesn't even crack a smile. That you can keep. He used to like that. Not anymore. She'll use his crappy childhood against him in an argument. You're still trying to prove that when you were kids, running around in those stupid uniforms, that it wasn't for nothing. She looks spiritually exhausted with him, like she knows she'll have to arrest him someday. The only reason I know she likes him more than a friend deep down is because it's just a fictional cliche, and she let him drink out of her travel mug. This is seriously the most intimate thing we see them do. Even when Diego tells her that his mother died, they don't give her good dialogue. It's implied he opened up to her, but to what extent? It's so co-workery. She doesn't even go for a hug. Just like, give him a goddamn hug, Jesus Christ. He put down his robot mommy. This show has not a clue. It seriously thinks it defrosted the Ice Queen. Yep, David Gray's This Year's Love is playing, but the lyrics are describing a relationship we never so much as saw the shadow of. Diego is caressing the dead body of someone he was nothing but a migraine to. Come along now, Allison. Your father's busy. He's always busy. Allison channeled her issues with her father into a drive for fame. She's found another avenue to get validation and attention. Although it seems occasionally annoying, she doesn't seem that bothered by it. It's kind of working as a band-aid to her problems, and it's made her very rich. But she has testing cheats enabled trude her way to the top, and it can feel a little hollow to her. She has done incredibly awful things with her powers in the past, mainly brainwashing someone into loving her. I heard a rumor that you love me. Probably not her husband, since he has the ability to leave. I hope it's not Luther. It's her adult voice saying it, so that seems unlikely. Or maybe she could have been saying it to her daughter to make sure she really loves her mom forever? Eh, I don't know. The main thing she's concerned about is the disintegration of her marriage and losing custody of her daughter. Allison's ex-husband Patrick divorced her for using her powers to take away their daughter's free will whenever she was being disobedient. The example we see is her using her powers to make Claire sleep. I heard a rumor. I heard a rumor. But you're really tired. You're really tired. You want to go to sleep? You want to go to sleep? 
I'm so tired, Mom. I know, sweetie. Patrick, I can explain. Patrick! And we know of some off-screen things, like her brainwashing her to stop crying, or getting her to eat broccoli, which honestly would probably be more disturbing to watch on screen. Despite the extremely awful things she's done with her powers, Allison doesn't come off as a sinister person. To me, she doesn't even really come off as some vain holier-than-thou celebrity, she just kinda seems like a normal person with above-average hair and makeup game. All the ways that she's manipulative are usually linked back to her earnest desire to protect. We see this in her subplot with Vanya and her boyfriend Harold, even though she does not once use her powers. She knows Harold's shady before it's obvious to the audience. It's subtle, but you can see in her personality where the impulse to abuse her powers comes from. She thinks she's perfectly calculated what's a justified and unjustified invasion of someone's privacy and autonomy. She just knows better. She's more experienced. And she's right often enough to have confidence in her gut reactions. So the thing about Allison is she's not using her powers because she unofficially swore to stop. I don't do that anymore. What happened? Same thing that always happens. I made a wish and it came true and I couldn't take it back. But really, she's not using her powers because her powers would just immediately break the plot. Think you want to rumor this, psycho? I don't need to because this bitch just pissed me off. We just want the boy. Oh, well in that case. No, you don't want her to spill the beans about why they're after five, your brother. I haven't broken out a spreadsheet to figure out which of the two siblings interact the least, but if I had to guess, I would say it's either Allison and five or Allison and Klaus. Allison and Klaus doesn't surprise me because Allison can literally solve one of Klaus's major dilemmas in one sentence. I heard a rumor you don't drink or do drugs anymore. Or if Klaus doesn't want to permanently part with his coping mechanism, she could just do a, I heard a rumor, you won't drink or do drugs for the rest of the week. If she can make someone who's not sleepy fall asleep, because remember, Claire doesn't just lay down and stop complaining, she falls asleep immediately. That probably means that she could hypnotize Klaus into thinking he doesn't feel dope sick. So the writers were like, oof. Don't let them talk. Ooh, walk past her, Klaus. Walk past the solution to your problems. Don't even ask, because if you ask, we have to make Allison say no, and that would make her look unsympathetic. And if she says yes, that prematurely ends your arc, so just, just like, ask Diego to tie you up. Well, you know, Allison does use her powers eventually. Yeah, we're gonna use Vanya's section to go over that scene in detail, but... When Allison's throat gets injured and she can no longer speak, the entire trajectory of where her character was going shifts and I have mixed feelings about it. On one hand, the scene where Allison is having Luther call her daughter and talk to her is one of the most heartbreaking scenes of the show. On the other hand, Allison's arc just kind of sputters out as soon as she gets injured. Allison loses the ability to express complex ideas to us. Ideas I really want to hear. Instead of having Allison write out more complicated sentences and linger on them longer or have a character read them, we are left to stare at Allison taking several seconds to write one word that doesn't answer people's questions. Now I understand the dramatic appeal of this. You have a character overwhelmed with the guilt, shame, and grief over how she's used her powers throughout her life. In particular, bending her own daughter's free will and making her husband come to see her as some type of monster who's a threat to their daughter. She remembers something from her childhood and realizes she was being used as a tool to portray Vanya on top of all of this. And I think she feels she has to fix Vanya to fix herself and the world. She's trying to redeem herself from the sins of her past. When they were writing this, I think they had a sense that they would get renewed for a second season and that this wasn't going to be the end of Allison's story. In the future, when people binge season one and go straight to season two without skipping a beat, it probably won't be as big of a deal. But as it stands, Allison's story just kind of bottoms out a little bit. It's not like she's given nothing to do. She becomes the group's pacifist and insists on saving Vanya and ultimately makes the decision to spare her sister's life. I wasn't sure where to put this section, so I'm just gonna put it in Allison since it seems to take up more of her screen time. I'm not sure where they're going with Luther and Allison's relationship. So I don't think the show will be like, yeah, your uncle Luther is your stepdad now. I think what they're going for is more of like a I treasure our bond because as dumb as this sounds, my crush on you was the most normal, least sucky part of my childhood and it taught me lessons about love and intimacy that maybe made us better socialized than our other siblings. But I don't think they stuck the landing because they're too consistently awkward around each other. And then you have the canon retcon what ifing, so I don't know, maybe they're going to bone town anyway. Every time a Luther and Allison scene begins, although they can't have some cute, genuine moments, I always feel like the writers are grabbing me by the hand and telling me to run, and I'm just like, where are we going, buddy? And the writers are like, just go with it. And I'm like, oh, if you insist. We were, we were 
just kids. Little kids. You were never just kids. You were meant to save the world. The thing about Klaus is giving up on trying is a lot easier than giving up on Karen. Let's begin with this flashback scene that's not about Klaus, but I think it shows something interesting about the way he's characterized. <laughs> Klaus. Thank you, mother. Boys will be boys. See, the first time I watched this, I was like, this is so forced. What the hell is he even doing? Can't he hear his dad yelling at them to get ready? Is this really realistic for someone his age? But then I realized it's just a blatant cry for attention. He wanted to get in trouble, it just went unnoticed by his dad. This is the type of kid who has given up on getting positive attention and will now settle for any attention, period. That is a documented reaction many children have to having emotionally neglectful parents. And it makes sense for Klaus specifically because Reginald's like, is this training? Yeah, I'll throw him in a mausoleum filled with spooky ghosts and wait for him to stop crying. Now, if you allow me to exhume this, Klaus is kind of Luther's opposite in this sense. Where Luther always held out hope that if he just followed the rules hard enough, long enough, he'd be rewarded, Klaus recognized it wasn't going to happen and gave up trying very early in life. He's rolling something at the dinner table as a teen, and adult Klaus is tearing open his old stuffed animals looking for pills like their piggy banks the day before your school field trip to a place with an awesome gift shop. His powers were the reason Reginald adopted him, but he's making himself as useful to his dad as Vanya by choice. It's significant that the one that abuses substances is the one whose powers function more like a mental illness. Hearing the dead makes it harder for him to concentrate and get good sleep. It overall lowers his quality of life, and Klaus reacts to his powers the way a lot of people who hear voices in real life do. He self-medicates in a medically unadvised way. In this season, him being an addict and struggling with that takes up a lot of his screen time, so it's a good decision that it has this practical foundation. They're not trying to make the whole thing about his dad and his crappy childhood. Those are just layers to why he fell down this rabbit hole. And the fact that the siblings are affected to different extents and have problems that might have existed without Hardgreaves makes everything feel more nice and natural. And this brings us to our next point. Not a complaint, just an observation. Our guy Klaus is the trash tier member of the Umbrella Academy. You can't change my mind, buddy. So Allison's powers seem to be tweaked a little from the comics, and if Diego can still hold his breath indefinitely, no one's mentioned it. But they nerfed the f out of Klaus. Klaus's powers are behind a paywall, and that paywall is called self-improvement. Narratively, I think this is a good decision, and it only causes a few small hiccups and they remember to fix most of them. While Klaus is included on merchandise and presumably has his heroic moments off screen, his powers aren't ever shown to be useful in the flashbacks, he's just kind of there. And I think it's really funny that they don't even try to pretend he's the recon guy. Come on, Ben. There's more guys in the vault. No, Luther didn't say that. That was Klaus, and he was like, Come on, Ben, a spooky ghost told me that there are seven guys in that vault. Netflix took all my powers away. What I'll give them kudos for is they remembered to change the significance of the children's numbers. They were originally numbered in order of usefulness slash how much Reginald liked them and saw potential in them. I do like that because it adds another layer of grossness to Reginald's relationship with his children, but I'm glad they gave up on it. The show only shows Reginald picking up who I assume is Vanya because the mother dressed the baby in pink and the baby's white and the name Vanya originates from Russia. Grace might have taken that into account. After that, we see Reginald returning home with the babies and the strollers are already numbered. Unlike in the comic where all the strollers are just black. Meaning, if I'm correct, Vanya might be number seven in the show because she was seventh collected. Which makes sense because I don't think this Klaus would be ranked higher than this Ben or Five. The main damage done here is to Luther since his number one position becomes slightly more symbolic. So let's talk about guns real quick and I promise we'll come back to Klaus. It's difficult to find a sweet spot when it comes to characters getting caught in bullet storms. You need the characters to be unsafe enough that you're afraid they'll get hurt, but safe enough so that the show doesn't break your suspension of disbelief. Because you don't want to feel like the character has plot armor. Yeah. Umbrella Academy has a handful of baffling moments where characters are right out in the open and should be getting turned into beefaroni, but magically, no bullets touch them. My favorite one is when someone made the decision that it was a good idea to have four people run from gunfire in a straight line down a bowling alley lane. Do you know how slippery those lanes are? I have wiped out just thinking about bowling alley lanes. This shot is kind of cool, but it's just ruined by the fact that you can't turn your brain off. 
This is why I think all the great gunfight scenes in this show are the ones where it's five versus others because he's a teleporter. The most teeth grinding guns moment is when Ben hears gunfire coming from inside the theater and points it out to Klaus. But they also spot Cha Cha walking towards the theater. If you're tabbed over playing a game or something, I don't even know how to describe this in a way that does it justice. Okay, with the grace of Cosmo Kramer stumbling into Jerry Seinfeld's apartment, Klaus runs into the theater yelling, Guys, it's Cha-Cha! Cha-Cha's coming! Waving his arms as he jumps down some steps and then looks back at the door he came in from, therefore turning his back to the theater of non-stop gunfire. He also doesn't immediately run to cover. Luther has to yell at him to get down. So yes, in this few seconds, he should have gotten shot, and it reminds you that all of them have plot armor right now. But it's reflective of a deeper inconsistency with how they write Klaus, and this is probably just the best example of it. I didn't know there were gonna be guns in the room I heard gunfire coming from. Boy, you didn't learn anything from Vietnam! It's at this point in the video where people who haven't seen the show are like, Vietnam? What? What? I thought he was born in 89! What the hell is going on?! This is supposed to be Klaus being Klaus, and since Cha-Cha and Hazel tortured him, it makes sense for him to be afraid of Cha-Cha. But this is the final episode of the season! The sound of non-stop gunfire must have been deafening. Yeah, he's your go-to comic relief, but come on, show, you don't have to accept every opportunity the universe gives you to treat Klaus like a clown. He's canonically served in the Vietnam War, where his boyfriend Dave was shot. Like, with a gun. It kind of undermines what he's going through if the fact that he was in the war only matters when it's the designated time to feel sad about Dave time. You gotta let that experience bleed into other parts of his character. I don't want to feel like he's a toddler and the script is his helicopter parent who's got his day so planned out that they're scheduling time for his mental breakdowns. Well, Klaus, it's half past twelve. It's time to go to your angst corner. What flavor of angst do you want? I don't want to go to my angst corner script! I want to be a comic relief character! And I want to run and hit people and steal ice cream trucks! Klaus, if you don't go to your angst corner, you don't get a banana sticker. I hate you! You're not my final draft! Let the record show that I think they were better at juggling Klaus's problems in the front half of the season. When it was just spooky angst, drug angst, and abuse angst, they were fine. When they had to add Vietnam PTSD and Dave, they dropped all the tomatoes. To be fair, how could you connect this to anything? From his perspective, he was gone for 10 months. The most traumatic experiences this character went through happened off screen. Which kind of just makes me question the decision to keep the Vietnam subplot at all. It is in the comics, it's just totally different from this. The idea of an addict medium having a dead boyfriend that he's gotta stay clean to see, like that, that's neat, that seems to be the point of all this. So I'm just gonna write a little letter to no one in particular, and it says question the Vietnam War. And all the eyes are dotted with little hearts because I love you. I know you're still a good person, Five. Otherwise, you wouldn't have risked everything coming back here to save us all. So Aiden Gallagher does a great job. Or is it Gallagher? His acting is completely in lockstep with the adults. And there are cool layers both to how his dialogue is written and how he delivers it. I can easily picture like a Jonathan Banks doing half these lines. But it's always subdued enough that it doesn't come off like a kid pretending to be mature, but just an adult in an awkward situation. But you know, there is a fun plot hole to Five's name. Are plot holes fun? Yep, having a YouTube channel is already melting my brain. Anyway, Five's name. He doesn't have one, because he disappeared before he was named. Except not really, because they made a mistake. They say Ben here. Come on, Ben. And they say Ben and Vanya here. Vanya! Ben! And Leonard has written out their names on his little homemade platform for his figures of them. We can see here that they all have normal names except five. I don't know how they missed this. They'll probably address it eventually. Maybe they'll make a thing about it. Maybe Robot Mommy gave him a stupid name. More likely he perceives the numbers not as a ranking system and he finds nothing particularly demeaning about having a number for a name. This is kind of fitting since Five is the one who has the least beef with Reginald. There are a few reasons why. He didn't experience all of it. He's had more time to get over it. It's kind of small potatoes compared to the hell his life was in the post-apocalypse. And he probably regrets not listening to his dad. I should've listened to the old man. You know, jumping through space is one thing. Through time is a toss of the dice. Even though Five is my fave, I'm not so sure about his arc. People keep telling him to let the apocalypse go, but he obviously doesn't because the problem isn't solved yet. Sometimes characters make it sound like Five's problem is that he needs to learn to reach out to others more, that he needs to stop trying to do things on his own. 
But he does. Even from the first episode, he seeks Vanya out. In episode two, he recruits Klaus. He's kind of inconsistent with how much help he needs. Like, sometimes he'll randomly do dumb things like not properly dress a wound because he thinks it'll slow the group down. He's mostly just really bad at explaining himself, and this problem is worsened by how bad his siblings are at listening to him and taking him seriously. I think his main character flaw is that he's extremely arrogant. He thinks he's earned the right to look down on people because of what he's gone through. I don't think that I'm better than you, number one. I know I am. <sighs> I've done unimaginable things, things you couldn't even comprehend. But because this flaw is funny, the show doesn't address it very seriously. The biggest jump Five makes in his development is giving up his emotional support object. Dolores is his mannequin wife who was with him for many years in the post-apocalypse. She actually has a consistent personality too, she's kind of the good angel on his shoulder. Dolores has definitely earned her place in the emotional support object hall of fame. But because most of the story is his siblings dealing with their own baggage, it can sometimes feel like Five is the only one working on the main plot. They all refuse the call and they just kind of do their own thing for the first five episodes. For some, this goes on even longer. They just so happen to be doing something that ties back into the plot by sheer coincidence. And so Five is the only string connecting us to the odd and interesting world of the Handler and the two assassins following him. Just another example, management sticking it to the working man. Oh, come on, not this again. I really like the two assassins, the diligent, work-focused Chacha and the calm but slowly defecting Hazel. I don't understand how you can watch this crap. You don't find it interesting how ordinary people live their lives? They're agonizing over kitchen cabinets as if the entire fate of the universe rests on whether they choose azure blue or asparagus green. And your point is? Sometimes there's beauty in the mundane, you know? Of the two, Hazel sort of emerges as the more three-dimensional character. Chacha never really gets to stretch outside of her workaholic, I will go down with this ship attitude. Not to knock her, overall I think she serves her function in the story in a fun way. I was surprisingly satisfied with Hazel's romantic subplot that breaks up the duo. I was surprised because I think this is the type of subplot that could be very easily botched. When Hazel starts talking to Agnes, a waitress at the donut shop, he finds her very endearing and she really makes him question himself. Agnes has been saving money to go to the country and open up her own donut shop. It'll take like a year for her to save up enough money to do this, but Hazel knows that the world will be over in a week. Agnes has worked her whole life for this, and the cosmic injustice being done to her snaps Hazel out of it. In the end, he can't save this world, but he can at least try to run away with her. Hazel and Agnes are a rare example of a May-December romance with a much older woman, and Steve Blackman had to actually fight to get this. People were giving him grief and he thought they were being hypocrites. Basically because pairing much older actors with much younger actresses is kind of ordinary cranberries at this point. And I'm celebrating his victory because I understand what he saw in this. Hazel's life as a time-traveling assassin means he's just kind of seen everything. Agnes has also just kind of seen everything, but in a more mundane way from being a waitress for 30 years. She's a muggle, but Hazel finds her wise. Hazel is getting reflective, he wants to retire from his career and do something different, and Agnes feels the same. Even though Hazel is much younger and Agnes is not a time-traveling assassin, they're kinda at the same stage of life. And they share the same interesting mixture of world weariness, optimism, and appreciation for the small things. So my award for second best couple in Umbrella Academy goes to Agnes and Hazel. Five and Dolores are first, obviously. Can we go home now? Ben is the sibling who died. There's not a hell of a lot to say about Ben. Yet. It's kind of frustrating that the characters know all the details, but we don't. The words on his statue give off a kind of suicide vibe. But what we do know is that his passing was a major breaking point for the family. Out of all the Hargreaves siblings, Ben and Klaus seem to be the most comfortable around each other. And this is funny and makes sense because Klaus sees his dead brother more often than his other siblings. I like how when Klaus is not exactly sober, Ben has his hood up and doesn't talk. He looks kind of sleepy, like Klaus is having trouble communicating with him. It's just a nice detail. When Klaus is sober, Ben can talk freely and, um... He seems like a chill guy. I like his outfit. He looks older now than he does in the last painting of him, but maybe it's just the wardrobe change. Sometimes he's shown reading. Not sure how he can do that. He never puts the book down, so I think it's just like his ghost book. I don't know how that works. Maybe that's what happens when you burn books. They go to ghosts. Uh, for negatives, I don't know. Most of his personality is just like being Klaus's life coach. Why not try starting your day with a glass of orange juice or some eggs? Hey! Life isn't supposed to be easy. Life is hard. But if you were a ghost following your drug-addled brother around because he's the only human who can talk to ghosts, that's probably what you would be like, so... Uh, remember kids, burn books! 
Hashtag and goes to literacy. Just a setup. You know what I appreciate? The fact that Vanya often doesn't wear makeup and when she does, it's always a reflection of how she's feeling and how much effort she wants to put into her grooming. And on top of that, the fact that when she is wearing makeup, it's like mascara, blush, and like a chill, natural lip color. She can't suddenly like cut the crease or do a perfect eyeliner flick. Because like, how would she know how to do that? She doesn't usually wear makeup. Most shows know to think about a character's wardrobe and hairstyle, but you'd be surprised how many shows will just slap makeup on people to try to make them look pretty and not really think through how a character would do their makeup or how much makeup a character would own. Literally everyone's makeup is thought out in this show. Allison has that this takes way longer than it looks makeup. You can tell because of how the crease is planted. Look at that. That's beautiful. Klaus just sort of smacks stuff on. They try to make it look like it was all done with one product smeared out. So you can imagine he just has one crusty eyeliner. Patch wears the scientifically calculated amount of makeup that no boss would ever complain about. Chacha does her eyes really heavy and dramatic and she uses false lashes and it just feels so in character. I think it's just the perfect amount of messy effort. Like, yeah, my blending's rough, but I'm gonna shoot you in these $12 House of Lashes falsies so you can literally die mad. So the conclusion of the Umbrella Academy makeup analysis that you didn't know you needed but totally did is the show constantly reinforces who its characters are and uses even the smallest details. You okay? Spend your whole life trying to forget about the crap you went through as a kid, you know? Can we please go to Wendy's? Okay, so let's not avoid the angst any longer. Have you ever watched the Mr. Rogers documentary, Won't You Be My Neighbor? He and I both had childhoods that you weren't allowed to be angry. You weren't allowed to show your anger. And we were never able to do it. It scared us. Music was my first language. I was scared to use words. I didn't want to be a bad boy. I didn't want to tell people that I was angry. but I could show it through you know, the way I would play on the piano. I could literally laugh or cry or be very angry through the ends of my fingers. Fred Rogers was the creator of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, an educational television show for young children, like kindergarten age. The show is slow and relaxing and very focused on everyday rituals, like tying your shoes and feeding your fish. The show concentrates on giving children uplifting messages and teaching them about life. Stuff like making mistakes and getting along with others, loss, and it tries to teach children that they're special and unique. Mr. Rogers wanted children to think that they have value just as they are, and I think that's a good foundation to build self-esteem off of. I've seen people break down when, for example, someone thinks their worth to the world is that they're smart, so them being smart is the foundation of their self-esteem. But then one day they fail a test, or make a mistake, or realize that they're falling behind other people in class. When that one trait is the foundation, the whole structure of a person's self-esteem can collapse. Because then they're like, well, what am I if I'm not smart? Am I nothing? What do I contribute? Mr. Rogers wanted to remind people, as hokey as it sounds, that you are special just by being you because you're not replaceable. You don't have to accomplish things to justify your existence. You're fundamentally lovable and capable of loving others just because you're human. He taught the importance both of emotional expression and self-regulation. You can express your emotions and then learn to control them, understand them, and engage with them. In 1983, Howard Gardner, a developmental psychologist, labeled the ability to understand your thoughts and feelings as intrapersonal intelligence. This is separate from another similar sounding category of his interpersonal intelligence, which is the ability to understand and communicate effectively with other people. Intrapersonal intelligence is a skill a lot of people struggle with and it can make their lives difficult and get them into trouble. It affects your ability to make long-term plans for your life and career, motivate yourself, pick up on your bad habits that are negatively affecting your life, and assess your mental health. Vanya has very little direction in her life, she only has one ability that she struggles to find true mastery in. This might mean that she struggles with self-talk, and so she doesn't know what she wants out of life, her career, or a romantic relationship. And how many years have you been stuck at third chair? 
At a certain point, it's not about practice. It's whether you've got something special. And maybe you just don't. You can put in your 10,000 hours, or you can go find something you're actually passionate about. The violin isn't just something she enjoys or uses to express herself, it's her first and last effort to make her existence matter. No one was around to teach Vanya that she had value on her own until it was too late and she wouldn't believe it. I find it interesting that Vanya was, in many ways, a sensitive child and a volatile child. But rather than work with Vanya, Hargreaves decided to dampen her emotions. He gave up on working with them, but Vanya was a very young child when he gave up. He decided to hide the whole thing. He never let her know what was going on or why he decided to medicate her to protect other people, even after she was grown. This also shows a very twisted side to Hargreaves' thinking. Was he really so sure that Vanya was such a creature of habit that she would continue to take the medication forever? The sick thing is he's kinda right, she might never have stopped if someone had not stolen her pills. The scene of Vanya slashing Allison's throat to stop her from rumoring her is extremely shocking. I still remember the way my mouth fell the first time I saw it. And Vanya's panicked crying and pleading was very gut-wrenching. It's an extremely blood-chilling scene. And it's tragic because they just don't know how to talk to each other, or trust each other, or when to back off so the emotions rise and everything keeps escalating. And when Umbrella Academy Syndrome comes in, he makes a sickening remark that is so appropriate for his character. Uh, uh, I, didn't, I didn't mean to. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't. You did what you uh. had to. If you would have told me at the beginning of the first episode that Vanya was the ultimate big bad, I would have been shocked. Apparently, I was one of the few people that didn't see this coming from a mile away. I caught on, of course, but the funny thing was that there was never really, like, a wow, twist, reveal moment. Instead, the story took a different tactic of slowly adding pressure and chipping away at Vanya. By the time she was in her suit flipping the lights off to her apartment, I truly came to appreciate this car crash in slow motion that is Vanya's story, even though it would have been unthinkable to me in episode one. Then they made the excellent decision to put her in a black suit, and she looks adorable and unnerving. As her apocalypse bringing attack charges, she plays away at her violin. The color strips from her suit and violin, turning white in a way that's visually similar to her comic book counterpart, and it's ethereal and beautiful. Her transformation into the villain of the story and the bringer of the apocalypse could have been prevented if she or the members of her family were able to cope better with the struggles in their life. But the way Umbrella Academy paints the story, it continually points out that they were never given the tools to do this because the adults in their lives failed them. Now, as adults, they have to build the tools on their own or with each other, and part Part of that is stepping outside of their own little world, their little square. Because as much as that cute dance sequence in the first episode represents their freedom from Hargreaves, it also represents their division from each other. So if you can't tell, I look forward to season two. And that's all I have to say about the Umbrella Academy for now. Look at this cute fan art people sent me on Twitter. Cute, cute, cute. If you like this video, open up the nearest window and yee loudly at the moon.